I've received many comments over the past year about working on hardware. Uh, since I've been busy with another project and will be busy with it for a couple more months, I'll do some videos on generic hardware stuff, uh, but I'll still be using 9Front uh, for demonstration purposes since the code is pretty clean and straightforward. Probably the most common comment I get is that people think that it is neat that I do uh, work on the hardware and stuff, but that it is too high level for them. And I'm here to tell you that is very much not the case. Uh, low level hardware work usually uses rather low level programming techniques. Uh, there are two main things to consider. First, a lot of hardware programming is essentially flipping switches. The switches are microscopic transistors, but switches nonetheless. The second is that the goals are clearly defined. Uh, the goal could be, you know, anything from blinking an LED to initializing virtual memory. But whatever it is, it has a working state and a limited number of ways to fail. In a lot of ways, hardware work is easier than pure software where things can get really abstract. The sky is the limit on feature creep and, you know, anything is possible. If there is one thing that gives hardware work an air of difficulty or mystery, it is that hardware manufacturers themselves can make it needlessly difficult with poor or missing documentation. Uh, another halfway problem is that manufacturers won't always stick to standards. So the documentation may be exact, and if followed, the device will work exactly as it was designed. But the real issue is that the device won't work as one would hope, given other similar designs. Uh, some examples off the top of my head are companies doing custom UART devices instead of just copying the old 16550 or I2C buses that don't implement the full I2C spec. Uh, in that last case, uh, they may at least give you some hint uh, by calling it something else like two-wire interface. Let's start with the first topic, though, flipping switches. The exact way to flip a given switch can vary, but they follow some general rules. Systems can use 8, 16, 32, or 64 bits, so working with 32-bit registers can be thought of like a bank of 32 toggle switches. Um, if you see pictures of old computers, like old IBM mainframes or PDP-11s, they will actually have long banks of switches on them, and that's how you enter um, numbers into the system. Uh, when I was working on MIPS systems, they have a coprocessor called Coprocessor Zero, and special instructions for flipping bits in the registers there. ARM chips have a, a mind-boggling amount of options, and they have a similar system for um, changing the values in them. After that are peripherals, and with modern systems on a chip designs, these aren't even outside the CPU chip itself. Uh, and they are often accessed through what is called memory mapped I.O. CPU registers and memory mapped I.O. can both be thought of as banks of toggle switches. With memory mapped I.O., the memory controller on the CPU will have a specific address range set aside to be sent to peripherals rather than to the actual RAM chips. From the programmer's point of view, it's no different from accessing values stored in memory, though. And uh, PCI also provides a way to map actual external peripherals to memory addresses. Further along, things like USB and I2C also have what amounts to toggle switches. But while the exact method of reading and writing the values for switches varies, they all follow the same basic principles. The value sizes are usually some standard word size, like 8, 32, or 64. The value can be changed and then written back, um, but it has to be at the same size. So you can't tell the hardware to just flip a given switch. Uh, you have to flip all the switches in that bank all at once. So if you don't want to change other settings, you have to read what they currently are um, and then write back some value with only the one bit modified that you want to flip. So the notion of flipping switches is fine for setting up hardware, but handling I.O. is a little different. While memory map devices are accessed as if they are part of the RAM, they are not RAM. Uh, for example, the typical UART serial device will have a register that holds 8 bits of data for a single character. While I might be expecting multiple characters of data to be incoming, I can't just move to the next memory address to read the next character. Since these devices are not actually memory, they have some other abilities like knowing when they've been read. So in the case of the UART, it can detect that I've read a character and then place the next character in that same specific, you know, address location. 
So to read a line of text out of a UART, I read the same address for the UART buffer over and over and over, and then have to write back to actual memory in ascending order all the letters and stack them up into a string. And the tools needed for working on this stuff are pretty simple outside the standard conditionals and loops. The two noteworthy things are unsigned integers and bitwise operations. Uh, the use of unsigned integers is pretty simple. None of this stuff has a negative value. A switch is flipped on to as it would be one and off is zero. You're never going to be negative one. And to make sure you never do that by accident, just use unsigned integers. Um, if you accidentally flip a value into negative, uh, what you end up writing to the register can be wildly off from what you were expecting. And bitwise operations are things like and, or, not, along with left and right shifting. And these are handy for both setting bits and for masking out specific bits. Uh, since registers and memory map devices often have to be read in blocks of 32 or 64 bits, masking is handy for checking if a single bit is on or off. So you'll read 32 bits in, mask for the bit you're interested in, and if it's greater than zero, you know it's on or set to one. So here are some examples. Uh, Plan 9 has the concept of an arch device for architecture. Uh, this is a device, you know, presented as a file system uh, for things that are specific to a given architecture. Um, so the kernel device has this hash P and we can see that it has various files in it. So this is all running on an Intel system. So I can do things like check the CPU type and this gives me P63204. You know, that means something to someone. Uh, let's try one that has a little bit more uh, textual information in it. So we can see what, what interrupts are allocated to what. And here we go. We see various, you know, devices in the system. Uh, since this here is my, I'm logged into my gateway machine, it has multiple Ethernet devices set up. But anyway, yeah, so this is reading you know, information from the hardware, doing some sort of formatting to put it into, you know, text and then outputting it. So I went ahead and made a, oops, a uh, arch device for the uh, MediaTek MT7688 chip I've been working on. Um, this is mostly just borrowed from the version for the PC. So it has all the standard stuff for actually setting up the files. Um, but then I made my own little thing to do my own CPU type. Um, I have a lot of variables here, probably more than I really need, but I wanted to make this demonstration as clear as possible and breaking everything out. So I'm going to be reading uh, three registers from the CPU. I'm going to get the processor ID, uh, something called config and something called config one. And so these are the uh, functions to do it. Since these aren't just sort of generic, um, you know, C kind of things, I'm, I'm doing something specific to the MIPS chip. I'm going to have to do some assembler to actually read them. Oops. So here's what the PRID function is the git config and the git config one. So in this case here on this, you know, this is particular to this MIPS chip and the assembler for plan nine. Uh, plan nine has been running on MIPS systems for a long time. PRID and config have been there since basically the beginning. And they set up the assembler to use this sort of little macro thing to just treat them as like any kind of other memory or register. So they just use a move to move the value from here to register one. This is a general purpose register that your programs have access to. Um, same for config. Uh, this will be a little bit more useful for actually learning something here. So for later stuff, they had to just add this instruction. This is basically move from coprocessor zero and it has some options. And we can see that this is broken down over here. So we have move from, and then the right option would be move to. So everything in a computer are just ones and zeros. 
um, and so are the instructions. So everything ultimately has to be broken down into that. So in this case, what it's going to do is translate that into this number here. And to that, this is an OR. It's going to add this source here. So it's going to put the source, shift it over 11 bits, the cell for select, and it'll, it's also added. It's just going to be at the end here. And then the uh, DST or destination, um, which is also added here, and it's put in and shifted over 16 bits. And that will construct um, 32 bits to be the actual ones and zeros for the instruction to um, get uh, that uh, 32 bits of data out of the CPU. So this here is the manual for the uh, MIPS 32 architecture, and it has the details on how this MFC zero instruction works. So you can see it's 32 bits. So we got bit zero to 31 and all that stuff has to be filled in. So it was four and a bunch of zeros. That four is basically here. This is designating like, I want to talk to coprocessor zero. Um, the command to get, you know, read from is actually just five zeros. Uh, then we have an option for this RT, RD. Um, this is kept to zeros and then the uh, SEL or the select. And we can read down here what it means. So RD and, R and select are for getting the data from a specific register in the CPU. Um, those will be loaded into general purpose register RT. Um, and that's basically it for this one. So two bits of information for what I want to read and where to store it. So going back to that git config one function here, you can see MFC zero, it's going to read from um, config and select one and store that in general purpose register one. So this config is all caps, which means it's probably some kind of macro. And indeed it is, so it is number 16. So this thing would actually translate into register 16, select one. And here is the manual for the, uh, the MIPS 24K processor. Um, the CPU manufacturers are really pretty good about giving out documentation for their chips. After all, they you know want people to use them. So here we go. We have the details on coprocessor zero, register 16, select one. So we can go down here. You can see it is a 32-bit register. So we got you know bits zero to 31. Some of these things will be just individual bits. Some of them will be groups. You know, some of them can actually be pretty decently sized. So when we go down here, like this MMU size range of bits, um, that actually translates into a number value. So this field contains the number of TLB entries minus one. Um, we have some other smaller ranges here. So this gives a, you know, a number for the number of, um, so this is the size of the instruction cache. We have the size of the data cache. Uh, some other information like, is there a coprocessor two? Uh, is there a floating point unit? So that is the, you know, register 16 select one. Up here we have uh, register 16 select zero. So this is what git config would pull up. And again, 32 bits has little bits of information. So some of these are just going to be stuff that's just kind of baked into the chip. You can just read it. Some of them will have options to also set them so you can read and write. Uh, but config zero here will have, uh, will tell you if this is a little Indian or big Indian chip. And some other information like what version of the architecture it is. And then the other one was the processor ID that was register 15 select zero processor identification. And it has some options like company option, company ID, processor ID. So it's gonna say that it's gonna come back as a MIPS 24K, that it'll be hex 93. Um, I actually know that that's going to be uh, wrong for this particular chip, but I'll get into that later. Um, and then a revision number. So it's going to tell me the 
Uh, that's actually broken down further inside this eight bits. So these will be the individual bits for numbers for the major, minor, and patch level revisions. So back to the Arch device here. Um, I have the code to pull out those 32-bit blocks of data from the CPU, and I'm going to store it in these integers. These are unsigned 32-bit integers. Um, I'm then going to do some bitwise operations to sort out and mask the company option ID, the processor ID, and the revision. So remember the uh, company ID was sort of at the high end, you know, the, the bits 30 and stuff. So I'm going to shift everything over and then mask out just the eight bits to hold that, hold that. Um, shift it over, mask just the eight bits and so on. Um, and then do further shifting and masking to get the major, minor, and patch numbers individually stored into their own uh, variables. I then have the switch to um, check that hex value for the processor ID. So remember it did say 93. Um, I'm putting in 96 and a few others. I know actually that the, uh, the MediaTek 7688s technically a 24KE processor because the E designates that it has a built-in uh, digital signal processor. So I'm then pulling out more values. This is coming from config zero. This will give me uh, the type of, or how the cache is set up, whether it's right through, uncached, right back, so on. Uh, that Indian value from there, so I'm getting just a single bit is all I'm looking for because it was either a one or a zero for big or little Indian. Uh, the Indian um, variable here is a character and I'm going to store some text in there, either MIPS or SPIM, which is Plan 9's way of designating big Indian or little Indian MIPS. There was a single bit for whether there was a floating point unit, a coprocessor two, uh, the TLBs was a actual numeric value, so pulling that out of uh, git config one. So again, I have to shift it over, mask out that value, and then it said that it was that number minus one, so I'm adding the one back. And then a little formula here for shifting out and masking the instruction cache and data cache value. And then this part here is what actually sort of puts it as text. So I'm dealing with plan nine here. Everything is a file. It uh, should just be something I open and read text out of. So I'm malloc some space to put my blob of text into. Um, I'm then going to, you know, use the Indian and the processor ID, um, you know, the major, minor and patch, print out the cache size, the TLB size, and whether there's a floating point unit or a coprocessor two. I'll then read that string back out, which will give me the number of bytes read out, you know, free that malloc. Um, this used thing is just uh, because sometimes the compiler complains that I'm not using L. Um, and then return with the number of bytes written out. And that is basically it for reading out the CPU information from the CPU chip. And I have that already done up compiled and running on my little router here. So that's the hash P device. And we can see I have two files in there right now. I have my CPU type. Oops. Um, so you can see I read it and it did indeed read those registers get the data out of it, and then my program formatted it into text. So it is SPIM, which means it's Little Indian. It is indeed the 24KE, not just the 24K. It's version 2.5.1, 64 kilobytes of cache, 32 of data cache, configured as write through, 32 TLB entries, um, no floating point unit, and no coprocessor two. And I also took that same file and put it on another MIP system here. So this one was a um, uh, a router I found at Goodwill. Um, cracked it open, soldered in some pins, and hacked it to run Ninefront. So it also has that CPU type file. So again, same thing when I go to cat, 
it's actually going to run through and read you know data directly from the um, registers held in the CPU. And this one comes back as MIPS, so it's a big Indian. It's a 74K processor, uh, version 2.4.0, um, and actually has very similar stats to the uh, MediaTek chip. So there we go. That was a couple simple programs just demonstrating actually writing directly or reading directly from the, uh, the CPU. And ARM chips have a very like similar sort of setup. Um, they, you know, they, those CPUs also have uh, registers inside them that can be read or written to, to change various functions. So let's see. I know the MP init. Whoops. Here we go. So here's an example of one for ARM. Um, in 9Front, they made a little sysread function um, to translate stuff into the ones and zeros that the ARM chip expects. But in this case here, this is uh, the function that will initialize other cores on uh, an ARM chip. So this is reading from this particular ARM system register. It's going to do like a mask and then add a number to it, which is part of this uh, index here in this loop. So it's going to be incrementing up and adding new numbers to whatever this register is. And we can check the ARM manual. There it is. So that one is the, uh, the multiprocessor affinity register. And what it's going to do is it's going to um, mask out here this last little bit, which uh, indicates the core number in the Cortex-A53 processor. Possible values are, you know, if it just holds a zero, that means you have a single core uh, chip. Um, a cluster with four cores here will have, you know, zero, one, two, and three as possible values. So that what that register is doing there is, is putting in a number to say, hey, I want to initialize a particular core. So the first time it loops through, it'll be like a one. So when the system boots, it's automatically at core zero. You can then tell it, hey, you know, go to core one and fire it up and start it. And then you loop through again and hey, start core number two and so on. So everything, you know, all CPUs have some sort of function like this. They go under different names and have different ways of accessing them. Um, but it is something there that you, you know, piece of hardware you can read and write data to. And now on to doing some memory mapped IO. Uh, so this is the manual for the uh, MediaTek 7688. Uh, I want to add to my Arch device um, a file that will list out all the peripherals and tell me if the clock for them is on or and if they are in a reset state. So this is the system control register for the MT7688, and it's mapped to this address here. Um, has a, several little registers in it. So I'm actually going to pull out these top two here. So this is actually going to give me a uh, chip ID from MediaTek, and these are ASCII characters 0 through 3 and 4 through 7, and that's at address 0 and 4. Uh, the other information I need is going to be um, in this clock config 1 at 30 and reset control at 34. So I already have some stuff ready to help me with the uh, memory mapped registers. I have a little macro here for the system control register base address uh, and this little kind of IO function. And what this will do is I can put in a, a data type and a address, and it's going to take that and mask it or or it with this uh, KSEG1 value. So something to keep in mind when poking memory map registers. Modern computers use cache, which is a bit of extremely fast memory directly on the CPU. So, you know, modern RAM is fast, but uh, many CPU cycles can pass while data is being transferred from RAM. To speed up some computation, that data is copied to cache, where it can be manipulated several times very quickly before being copied back to RAM. With memory mapped I.O., the trouble can happen when you try to write to a device, but the instruction gets written to the cache and then doesn't get sent to, you know, out from there. 
if you read it back, the CPU will quickly read back the value you've written to the cache, um, but the device will seem unresponsive. So in the case of MIPS, they handle this by having a band of memory mapped to a corresponding area of kernel memory, uh, but it'll uh, write to that address without doing any caching. So it's the uncached uh, memory addresses. So yeah, that means any writes done to the address range will go right through the cache and out to RAM or to the device you're trying to write to. Uh, for ARM chips, this is handled when you set up your virtual memory. You have to figure out what range of memory is mapped to a device, give it a new virtual address range, and then tag it as uncached. So your system knows not to cache um, the instructions you're trying to send to the device, but just send them directly to the device. So this is a 32-bit system, and I'll be reading back 32-bit blocks of data. So I have my unsigned 32-bit integers here. I'm going to pull in those two chip IDs. So basically I set this up, and it's basically just saying it's pointing to an actual memory address and just saying whatever's in that memory address, store it here. So I got my chip IDs, my clocks, and my resets. Uh, and this big ugly block here is basically just shifting through and masking out each individual ASCII character and storing them in this uh, chip ID, you know, char. So I'm also doing, you know, the same sort of thing for setting up and formatting out the text. Um, in this case here, I'm going to go through this loop, a little for loop here. I'm going to go through uh, this... Uh, structure here that I've already set up and I have that up here so this is going to have a name the clock mask and the reset mask and I've set up all the possible peripherals on the MediaTek chip and set where the bit will be for the clock and the reset so we can see in the manual here that the clock settings for the device are just individual bits so there'll be just one bit here for, you know, the pulse width modulation, the SD card, the MIPS counter, you know, PCI2, all the stuff gets one little bit for turning the clock off and on. And I kind of lucked out on this one in that the reset is also in the same exact spots. So some of them have a clock, but no reset, and some of them have a reset, but no clock. And I handle that little issue by, if it doesn't have a clock, I just put in a zero, but still have the masking bit for the reset. Um, and the other way around, if it's the other way around. So in this case, this one has a clock, but no reset option. So my little loop down here will go through uh, everything that's held in that little structure there. It'll check and see if it has the option to have, in this case, a clock. If I set it to zero, that'll be NA. If it does have that mask, it will then, you know, read the uh, 32 bits, mask out just the one bit for that particular device. And if it's a one, it'll store the string on or off and do the same thing for the resets. It then prints out that string and returns. So, so I can demonstrate that now. So I have my little system control file here. And I can copy that. So when I enter here and run it, it's actually going to have the kernel read specific memory addresses, pull the data out, sort through it, and interpret all the little bits mean. Oops, that's a CPU type. I already did that one. I want to do system control. Oh, and there it is. Well, it looks like I got my formatting off a little bit, but it did indeed work. So. You know, some of these things I can check, you know, obviously I'm reading this thing over the network. So the ethernet device, the clock is on and it's not currently being reset. Um, same with the uh, UART here. I had to use that to boot the system up. So there we go. This is actually reading memory mapped uh, registers, pulling the data out and doing it. So writing to it would be the other way around. I would change the value, write it back, and that could like turn the clocks off and on or reset the device. In the case of resets, what that would do is uh, the peripherals themselves are also memory mapped. They have registers that hold ones and zeros. Um, if I change the device and want to just sort of make it go back to whatever its factory default is, I can re you know 
it's literally resetting the, the device, like hitting a reset button. It goes back to whatever its boot settings are. So that's what that would do. So in the next video, I'll do some demonstrations of actually writing to these CPU and device registers to affect the way they operate. Uh, for now, I'll leave with one more bit of information. Everything I've been doing here is in kernel space. Most programming people learn is in user space. The difference is that all modern computers use virtual memory for user space programs. This is to keep programs from overwriting or snooping on data in memory used by other applications. In kernel space, you have unconstrained access to any and all memory. ARM systems will do things like let you run the kernel in virtual mapped memory, but it's still full access, just with different addresses. So even if you're used to using things like pointers and the like in application programming, you largely don't have to care what the actual address is. Uh, every time you fire up the program, the kernel will give it some fresh block of virtual addresses to use. So in kernel space, you do have to know where data is being stored. And when dealing with memory mapped IO, reads and writes of data have to go to specific addresses. So there is some precision in doing something like flipping a single bit at a specific memory address to say activate the USB system. But aside from that sort of seemingly esoteric knowledge, accessing blocks of bits is not all that complicated. And uh, using 9Front here makes it uh, really easy for playing with kernels. Um, if you set up a file server and then have another test system that boots as a diskless terminal, it's very easy to have it pull, you know, some testing kernel off the network and boot it. And if your, you know, your kernel hacking crashes, no harm, you know, it's a diskless terminal, no data is lost. Um, so it's a great way to sort of iterate through and, and, and practice hacking on kernels without having to uh, go through a lot of hassle. So anyway, that's it for now. Um, and as usual, have fun.